and, uh, and, and children and babies with wings. They have extra arms. They're <laughs> angels. Um, I think um, the, the, uh, the, the concept of miracle vo very, very low birth weight babies, I think uh, I picked this title because I think it's a, ti it's a kind of title we all don't like very well. Because when our local newspaper has a story about a miracle baby who weighed 400 grams and survives and now is totally intact, then everybody thinks that all these babies are going to survive. And that's clearly not true. On the other hand, I think that we underappreciate or don't think about enough how really surprising these babies are. And also, we don't necessarily think so much about what the implications of their survival is in terms of developmental phenomena. So I'm going to talk about uh, a couple of different organ systems briefly. I don't have a, need a disclosure say, uh, statement. To try to get at, uh, to give you some ways that I'm thinking about at any rate, about what, what, what allows these babies to survive. And uh, depending what you define as a miracle baby, if you're defining the, uh, you know, uh, uh, 20 years ago, a miracle baby that survived was 28 weeks gestation. Now that's a 24 week baby. Um, but their survival is almost routine at 24, 25, 26 weeks. And so my goal is to examine who these babies are and ask why they survive. So, and, and keep in mind, what I'm really talking about is a representative, very low birth, 24 weeker, 60% of gestation, about 600 grams. And if you think of that, just think about that, 60% of gestation. I mean, there are no animal model systems or anything else where anything that of 60% gestation will survive. A 60% fetal mouse you can't even find when you look in the uterus. So we're, we're talking about a really um, aberration of nature for a baby who's 24 weeks to survive. And I think it's important for us to keep in mind who we take care of as neonatologists. These are data from the Vermont Oxford Network on um, 107,000 NICU admissions for the year 2008. And uh, I've highlighted a couple of boxes here that I think are worth commenting on. So in this population, where I've just put po a percent of the population that's admitted to NICUs, most of our babies still are big. Uh, they're term babies with anomalies and a variety of things like that, or uh, C-section babies who are transitioning. Uh, we have an increasing proportion of these uh, late preterm infants, and that's 35% of the population now. And as I think we're all aware, those babies have unique problems that uh, deserve a special discussion, and that's not the subject of what we're talking about here. The greater than 41-week babies have virtually vanished in the units that are participate in Vermont Oxford. And that's really, I think, uh, a tribute to both neonatology and obstetrics. Those babies were a real problem a number of years ago, and they virtually vanished. For people trying to study meconium aspiration, it's really tough now because we don't have these post-dates babies. We still have, of course, a lot, and we're focusing on these 24 to 6-week babies, and some of us are really not very enthusiastic about supporting these babies that are less than 24 weeks gestation, and other people are, and that's still an ethical discussion. <laughs> if we replot these data now for babies less than 1250 grams, so we get rid of all the big ones, based on gestational age, the 24 to 26 week baby actually makes up about 25% of our nursery populations. And then there's some of these younger ones and then there, obviously there are a bunch of older ones. So we know who these infants are. They're a relatively small percent of the preterm population, 30% or so. They're the pa babies that stay in the hospitals the longest and run up the highest costs and have the worst neurodevelopmental outcome. And we know about their survival advantages. It's birth weight, it's gestational age, it's antenatal steroids, and it's female uh, sex. So what do we really need to have a survival in one of these tiny babies? Well, first of all, we have to have a lung that can exchange gas. And that you can say with or without surfactant, because we can get them to exchange gas with surfactant very often. And we have some other organs that are really important for their survival. One's a kidney. I think the immune system is probably important, and I think we would all say that the brain is ultimately important for their survival. 
And these organs, um, just as a, uh, uh, going into this talk, must mature enough for survival. Uh, I could include the skin as well. If a 24-weeker was born with a skin of a 24-weeker and it didn't become rapidly skin of a more mature baby, we would not have survivors. That skin has to change within the first day or two after delivery or we just couldn't manage the baby, for example. So the essential organ ad adaptation for these, these babies that we've always thought of traditionally is the lung. And these are very old data from uh, 1974 on amniocentesis, were, which were done at the time in essentially normal women. Uh, I don't even know if they were done with consent. Uh, at the time of development of the LS ratio to test lung maturation. And um, it's got an arrow on this thing. Yep, here it is. And what we know in normal women who are going to term is that the LS ratio crosses to or becomes mature at about 35 weeks gestation. And that this change can occur er at earlier, oops, I've got to go back here. Uh, and this can occur at earlier gestations in babies who have problems, ruptured membranes, things like that. But I think what we don't remember often is that the average baby is not going to mature his lungs till around 35 weeks gestation. Our babies who are delivering around 35 weeks gestation are not average. They're all abnormal for some reason. And they all have a degree of lung maturation, I believe. The incidence of RDS we uh, code out or say is extremely high at these early gestational ages. These are data from 2004 on preeclampsia and controls. I think this is interesting also in thinking about lung maturation because if someone asks you, well, what causes lung maturation, your response is, of course, antenatal steroids. But why then do preeclamptic babies have a higher incidence of RDS than babies without preeclampsia? Because preeclampsia clearly stresses the pregnancy. It causes growth restriction, it causes placental problems, it causes labor and delivery problems, and those babies actually have elevated cortisols relative to, to other babies but yet they don't have induced lung maturation. So I think that's a little bit of an enigma in terms of how we think about this. These are Vermont Oxford data, uh, again, on these 1250 gram babies on what kind of uh, care they give. Now, obviously, most of these babies are, are more mature than the 24, 25 weaker, but we do a lot of things for these babies to get them to survive. And again, in this population of very preterm infants up to 28 weeks, we say uh, in large data sets, true or not, that most of these babies have RDS. Most of these get babies get surfactant, and Colin and I presented data that that's probably not optimal care to say they all have RDS or to give them all surfactant because 50% of them, I'll make the case, probably don't have that. BPD is clearly a, functional, a function of gestational age and C, as is the use of CPAP. But there are clearly other clinical experiences, which many of you have, uh, that suggest that RDS and surfactant treatment uh, uh, is, incidences are quite different than some of these large data sets from the U.S. and uh, other parts of the world. And uh, this is a, a slide just pointing out uh, what Colin and I were talking about the other day. If we use treatment with surfactant as a marker for significant respiratory distress syndrome, depending on different experiences and different gestations and one thing or another, basically, if you average that up, about 50% of the babies don't have respiratory distress syndrome. So they actually have massively induced lung maturation because they normally wouldn't have lung maturation on average until after 35 weeks gestation. And here they're getting born at 25 weeks to station, two and a half months before that. And 50% of them don't have RDS. I think that's just a biological miracle that that kind of induced maturation can actually occur. And we see it every day. So what are the known mechanisms of induced lung maturation? Well, there are really only two that are, that are relevant to clinical medicine. Uh, there's been an incredible amount of work done over 40 years with, on all sorts of different hormones that will modulate lung development, much of the work in vitro. Uh, 
But the only things that have translated to understanding what's happening in clinical populations are the use of antenatal steroids, and they decrease the incidence of RDS in randomized trials by about 50 percent, so they're less than perfect as a therapy. And the newer information that uh, Miko Hallman and we and a number of other people have developed over the years, that antenatal inflammation for some curious reason also induces uh, lung maturation. And of course, most of our babies now are exposed to antenatal steroids. Um, I, I, I think we finally convinced all our obstetric colleagues that these tiny preterm infants should be exposed to antenatal steroids. And what we know is that their, the exposure favors treatment by any assessment that we can look at. So the use of antenatal steroids is important. These are data from uh, a sheep model that I just do want to make one point, though, about uh, antenatal ster steroids and, and the fetus, if I can get an arrow to work here, that if we give repetitive doses at weekly intervals in a sheep, we can increase the amount of surfactant. And I would have you look at this, that actually a week's exposure to antenatal betamethasone doesn't do very much to the surfactant pool. But if we expose these animals to uh, steroids, here we go, we cause growth restriction. And there's been a number of uh, concerns about growth restriction in the human fetus. The problem is, or the good thing is, the human fetus doesn't really grow fast enough that if we inhibit growth for a couple days, we could ever detect that growth inhibition in populations of babies. But certainly in the large animal models, there is some growth restriction, and that's a concern about antenatal steroids. These are data from Sydney. There's data from all over the world now that the occurrence of histologic choriamnionitis, purely as, if you like, a biomarker of exposure of the fetus to inflammation and perhaps infection is incredibly frequent as we go down in gestational age. And if you don't look for it, you won't find it, but um, in most populations that have been looked at, this is really a common finding. So our babies are actually exposed pretty consistently to the two major drivers of lung maturation, antenatal steroids and uh, betamethasone. The problem with this diagnosis of choriamnionitis, and this is a Venn diagram of the world of prematurity, is that it's a really complicated diagnosis that's very imprecisely made, and the variables we don't understand are duration, the organisms, the intensity of the exposure, the location of the exposure, is it just the membranes, the amniotic fluid, fetal infection, and so on and so forth. And I think what we know from the animal models, and I'll show you a little bit of data, that some of our infants will have induced lung maturation as a benefit, if you like, of, of, of exposure to inflammation. Others will have systemic, systemic inflammatory responses, which might not be so good, and a few will be severely affected, and we know this from autopsy studies where they're stillborns or they have severe uh, inflammation problems at birth and don't do well. So I just want to show you a little bit of our kind of work that we're doing to try to understand this. Uh, this is, I think, an experimental demonstration of proof of principle. And I think the kind of stuff that uh, uh, Bernard talked to you earlier about, about animal models, and what he's going to talk to you about, about stem cell therapy and animal models, these are proof of principle. These are how biological systems work. The question is, is how we translate that to the human, where everything is so much more complicated. Um, but inflammation works in terms of lung maturation. What we do is we give ultrasound-guided intraamniotic injections of pro-inflammatory things like LPS, IL-1, or live urea plasma. And we use urea plasma because it's the organism most frequently associated uh, with preterm labor and delivery in the human. And then we look at uh, how the fetus is, gonna, is doing. And this is just a, um, uh, a description of what happens to the lung after you put endotoxin or LPS in the amniotic fluid. And uh, on the x-axis is time after um, endotoxin, five hours, 24 hours, 72 hours, or seven days. And basically, we get inflammatory cells in the alveolar lavage of the fetus. We get cytokine expression in the lung tissue of the fetus. We get an apoptotic response and a proliferative response. And so this is really a prototypic pro-inflammatory injury initiation of repair type of response. So the fetus is responding 
uh, just like anybody else would to this organism with exposure to the lungs. What's interesting in the fetal sheep is that an exposure to an inflammatory response in the amniotic fluid doesn't change plasma cortisol in the fetus. So this is really low. So that the improvement in lung function, this is compliance, this is PO2 when we ventilate the animals, and this is a measure of CO2 exchange in the animals. Basically, the improved lung function is not mediated by cortisol. So this seems to be a direct effect of the inflammatory effect on the lung, and we've done a number of experiments to prove that that's true. So we have two pathways to lung maturation, and what's interesting is that they're just the opposite pathways. One is anti-inflammatory, antenatal steroids, and the other is pro-inflammatory, endotoxin, urea plasma, something like that. But these two different pathways meet in the outcome of lung maturation. And they not only meet, they amplify each other. These are data that actually aren't published yet. It's an experiment we did a couple years ago, and we're just working it up. This is the amount of cell, uh, surfactant in bronchoalveolar lavage is a very preterm sheep. And the controls have almost none, pardon me, have almost none. The LPS exposed animals, this is not going to work. Somebody have a pointer? Um, then I won't keep, uh, this one here? Ah, okay, cool. Oh, yeah, I'll use that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool, thank you. Um, these are the intervals before preterm delivery that we expose the fetus to either uh, saline, LPS, or betamethasone. Uh, so this is one week before, and this is two weeks before preterm delivery. So we're trying to sort of mimic what might be happening in a clinical situation. And the saline, saline animals have very little surfactant. LPS a week before induces a lot of surfactant. If we do this two weeks before, we get even more induction. Betamethasone has a very modest effect on surfactant. If we give the beta first and then the LPS, if anything, we seem to inhibit surfactant production. But if we do it the other way around, we give LPS and then beta, if anything, we amplify the production of surfactant. So these things interact, and um, most of our babies, many of our preterm babies, are exposed to both, both these stimuli, and they both induce surfactant. And if we look at this functionally, in terms of a pressure volume curve, where we're, we've inflated the lung to 40 centimeters of pressure with air, and then we're deflating the lung versus lung gas volume, and this is per kilogram body weight of the animal, these guys have really bad lungs. They only hold 10 mil, uh, uh, mLs of gas at 40 centimeters of water pressure. That's an animal you actually can't ventilate to, for all intents and purposes. On the other hand, look at the effect of LPS uh, 14 days before delivery and betamethasone seven days before delivery, and these responses parallel the responses in the surfactant amount. And look at the effect on, if you like, FRC. It's massive. And so we really think that our tiny preterm infants are doing so well today because so many of them ex are exposed to both these stimuli uh, and are, have improved lung maturation. I think the clinical identification of RDS is very imprecise and it's, compound, it's confounded by how and when we use surfactant. And I think we can actually increase RDS by our clinical management. So if we aggressively ventilate a baby in the delivery room, then I think we can actually cause ARDS, which we cause all, car, call RDS. We give the baby surfactant, we say they have RDS, and we're actually perhaps causing the disease. Most of these very uh, small babies who survive, I think, have some degree of lung maturation. I can't do the experiment of taking 20 women who were going to go to term with normal pregnancies and do a C-section at 24 weeks. That would be a little unethical. But my hunch would be that we would have a very hard time ventilating those babies even if we gave them surfactant because those babies are not will, uh, ready to be delivered. Um, okay, so now let's talk about the kidney. I don't know anything about the kidney. I was, I've just been thinking about it and looking at some of the old literature. Because again, I think uh, our clinical experience is such, it's sort of like the skin. The skin, if the skin doesn't rapidly cornify after these very preterm infants are, are, are born, we are going to have a problem. 
because they essentially have a burn over their whole body until they cornify. Um, it turns out that the kidney maturation is pretty interesting in terms of the timing of the care of these tiny preterm infants. We know a little bit, um, there's fewer glomeruli predict hypertension in later life in the human population in general. And we know that low birth weight infant uh, birth weight is associated with hypertension in later life. So just let's look at a little bit of kidney development. This is gestational age in the human, and this is the number of nephrons. So it's the tubule and the glomerulus that has to come together here. Well, look at the curve for the development of the nephron. It actually starts really here at about 20 weeks gestation. Uh, the the Tubule, the ducts are completed by about 20 weeks gestation, which is exactly the same time that the airways are, are completed. But then what happens is you have to form your glomeruli and hook this all up, and nephrogenesis is occurring between 20 weeks and about 35 weeks gestation. So the nephrons of these babies are actually being formed right at the time we're taking care of them. Okay? So what a great opportunity to screw something up because in utero, their kidney function is going to be entirely different than it is postnatally, and in fact, we don't need kidney function for relatively more normal uh, fetal development, perhaps except for the lungs. These are, again, very old data, looking at GFR during late development uh, in the human, and what happens to GFR after very preterm delivery. So in 1986, very preterm delivery was 28 weeks gestation. So we really don't know what these curves look like for 24-week gestations because this work hasn't been done. And again, if there's a fellow out there looking for a research project, I think looking at kidney development is a really good uh, opportunity in these babies. So these babies do improve their kidney function modestly over this period of 28 weeks to 34, 35 weeks. Presumably, this massive increase in function after preterm delivery at let's say 34 weeks here, is related to the fact that the baby already has his glomeruli, so he's just getting his function together. While GFR here goes up very modestly in our tiny preterm babies. So our GFR is really low, and we know that if we don't manage their fluids and electrolytes carefully, they won't survive. But I would suspect if their GFR didn't improve at all, we would be even in more trouble than we presently are with a lot of these babies. This is fractional sodium uh, excretion in these babies versus gestational age. Um, and this goes down to almost 26 weeks gestation. And we know that they spill sodium because they've got lousy tubular function. They do very little reabsorption. So their GFR is very low, and their tubular absorption is very low. So the net effect is we have a high urine output, but it's full of sodium. Now, that's very, that's essentially renal failure. It's a high output renal failure that we manage clinically with our fluids and electrolytes. But it can't get much worse for these babies to survive. And they do mature their kidneys fairly effectively across gestation to give us an advantage such that we can actually get them to survive. So the very preterm kidney with nephrogenesis occurring between, uh, is not complete until 34 to 36 weeks gestation. They have high urine output, um, a very low GFR, and a high fractional excretion of um, sodium. But there is adaptation. And that adaptation that occurs over the first days to week or so of life, I think is so important to our ability to have these babies survive. And fortunately for everybody, nephrogenesis continues despite our care. This is an example from um, preterm baboons that were ventilated for, I believe, 28 days. And these are glomerular numbers or generations at, um, at 125 days gestation. This is at a, uh, in normal animals at uh, term. And these are animals that have been put on ventilators. And it turns out that they grow, grow glomeruli. And actually, that's sort of interesting. Uh, well, this is one other uh, clinical report. Looking at glomerular number, and this is the normal number in the adult, um, these are um, term infants who've died. These are preterms who have died at less than 40 weeks of age, and these are preterms who've died later uh, after birth so that they're out 
here at a, a year of age, they come up a bit short with glomerular number. And so I think that is a real concern for us that although they can grow glomeruli, they may not reach a full potential. And without reaching a full potential, they are at risk later in life for hypertension. But it turns out from animal models, and I don't have time to go through all these data, that we know there's a number of things that interfere with nephron uh, development in animal models. One is fetal growth restriction. The other is postnatal growth restriction, and many of our babies have both of these. Fetal corticoid exposures, postnatal corticoid exposures, and there's a whole bunch of drug exposures that interfere with nephrogenesis uh, in animal models. And many of our babies are exposed to all these things but a bit of a miracle is that they continue to develop their kidneys under most circumstances, despite what we do for, to them. And we are, we've not really been concerned that we severely interfere with kidney development. If, we, if that occurred, I think we would have major problems. This is another observation about how subtle ki kidney development can be in terms of long-term outcomes. But we don't see too much of this in babies, at least we may have not have looked, looked for it. These are studies from Australia in preterm sheep exposed to maternal glucocorticoids, term is 150 days. So these exposures are very early. So this is a three-day exposure at 27 to 28 days gestation. This is just implantation, basically. And this is an older uh, exposure here. And they've evaluated the uh, fetal effects and then the effects at um, much later uh, periods of time. And of course, these, this exposure is only about 1% of gestation during which this cortisol, uh, this glucocorticoid exposure has occurred. And what do they find? Well, as these lambs deliver an age, the dexamethasone exposed animals at a very early ge uh, gestation have elevated blood pressures. So this is programming, the kind of things people talk about programming, of organ function with an exposure to the fetus. Uh, these are data from the same animals, same kind of animals. And these are kidneys of animals that are now seven years of age. So this is ver not a very good project for a uh, graduate student, because you have to expose the fetus to steroids and wait seven years. But at seven years of age, the body weights are the same, the kidney weights are the same, the kidney to body weight ratios are the same. But look at this, glomerular number is way down because of an exposure to glucocorticoids for three days very early in gestation. And I think these are concerning kind of things for what's going on in the human. On the other hand, the good news is that uh, our very low birth weight infants do have sufficient renal function to survive. They continue to form nef nephron nephrons despite a bunch of exposures that in animal models disrupt cut kidney development. And although they may end up with fewer glomeruli, that's probably a treatable disease versus um, interfering with development earlier in life. So let's move on a little bit to innate immune responses in terms of this issue of programming and changing how the fetus responds. So how does the fetus respond to types of inf inf infection and inflammation associated with preter preterm delivery? Um, it turns out that the two exposures that induce lung maturation that are occurring in our babies also cause immune modulation in the fetus. So this is just an example of monocytes from um, the blood of either an adult sheep or a preterm uh, lamb. Ex uh, and this is after maternal exposure to betamethasone, a single exposure. Initially, we have an anti-inflammatory response, as you'd anticipate followed by an induction response such that these are similar. So betamethasone will modulate immune function in the fetus. Doing the same experiment, just graphed a little bit different, um, and looking at IL-6 response, and now these are macrophages and monocytes from the fetal sheep lung, the same phenomena occurs. So if we expose the fetus to pro-inflammation, they have immature lung monocytes, but after exposure, those monocytes mature and start behaving like uh, more normal adult monocytes, again, modulating an immune function in the fetus. What's interesting about this is we actually induce the maturation pathway for 
ma monocyte macro macrophage maturation in the fetus by an exposure to an inflammatory stimulus. The, the, um, the piece of information that you need is that the fetus doesn't have alveolar macrophages. The human fetus doesn't and animal models don't either. Macrophages appear after delivery. And on the other hand, we can take a very preterm animal, expose that animal to intraamniotic endotoxin, and GMCSF goes up in the lung only, not in the liver, not in the plasma, just in the lung. This is mRNA, but the protein also goes up. up. There's a transcription factor called PU.1, which is a marker for monocyte maturation. And it turns out that within two days that's appearing, and this is, I believe, seven days here, that this, the, there's all these um, uh, PU.1 labeled cells in the lung indicating mature monocytes. And when we look in the alveolar lavage, we now see mature macrophages. So the sentinel inflammatory cell in the lung is actually induced in the fetus at a very early gestational age by an inflammatory exposure, which is sort of neat in terms of activating the inflammatory system, but it might not be such a good idea if your fetus then has an inflammatory exposure and then has a more aggressive inflammatory response, because now the, the fetus is basically armed to have an inflammatory response. So let's look at how that inflammatory response might occur in the lung. These are um, a, a little more complicated experiments. These fetuses have been exposed to intraamniotic LPS in, uh, for two days before preterm delivery, seven days before preterm delivery, or seven plus two days before preterm delivery. And we're looking here at IL-1 beta mRNA um, uh, expression in the fetal lung. And the control is very, very low. And when we ex expose these animals to, uh, to endotoxin, IL-1 goes way up in the lung. But this response is decayed by seven days. On the other hand, if we do a double exposure of the seven-day exposure, we'd anticipate this, plus a two-day exposure, we anticipated that we would get that bar graph, but actually we got one that was much more similar to the control. So the fact that the fetus has seen an endotoxin response, it actually downregulates its pro-inflammatory response. And that may be rather clever and protective because I think what we know from clinical medicine in a very general way, if you have a severe inflammatory response in the uterus, you have a termination, basically. That, that pregnancy goes to early termination. So the fetus seems to have figured out a way to perhaps get around that. The other thing that's rather interesting about this is that, that when, we, when we as organisms respond to viruses or bacteria or parasites or, or any other sort of organism, we do it through a panel of receptor molecules uh, called the TLRs that are sitting on the surface of our cells. And these are the agonists for, a, uh, for five different receptor signaling pathways. And if we expose our fetus to endotoxin, where there's minimal response in terms of an IL-6 secretion, and these are um, monocytes, macrophages from the fetal lung, minimal response, this is an adult alveolar macrophage response. If we expose these animals to LPS, they actually induce a cross tolerance in the sense that they're now able to not only respond to the gram negative LPS, but the gram positive GBS or a yeast or something else. So they now have developed their whole ability to, develop, uh, to have innate immune responses to all sorts of different signaling pathways. So we're just not modulating a single pathway, but multiple pathways are ac activated. And this probably has a lot to do with with post-receptor signaling pathways that are common in these organisms, in these babies. We also can paralyze all these different pathways uh, by a second exposure. So that's a bit of an artificial system because we're using a, a sledgehammer. Uh, we're using a club because we're basically using LPS, which is an incredibly potent pro-inflammatory. And most of our babies that have chorioamnionitis are probably not seeing E. coli LPS, but they're seeing a lot of low-grade infectious inflammatory organisms. So we've done the experiment of giving live urea plasma into the amniotic fluid. Again, this is the organism most frequently associated with uh, preterm labor and delivery. 
Uh, if we give the urea plasma seven days before preterm delivery, and these are all delivered at the same gestational age, we have no, essentially no, IL-1 beta mRNA secretion. We know the lung is colonized. We know the amniotic fluid is colonized. The organism is there. There just isn't much of an inflammatory response. These are animals that receive the urea plasma two and a half months before preterm delivery. So they're colonized from 50 days gestation to 124 days gestation. They grow normally, they develop normally, and they have a high titer of organisms in their lungs and their amniotic fluid. So they cope with the organism just fine, and they don't have very much inflammation. These are the data that I just showed you about what happens if you give LPS by intraamniotic injection. And what you do is you induce a massive induction of uh, IL-1 uh, uh, beta, mRNA, and protein. If the, if the baby, the fetus, saw urea plasma just seven days before the two-day exposure, now you have no blunting of the inflammatory response. But look at this. These animals have had urea plasma exposure for two and a half months, and now we give them endotoxin, and they don't even see it. They have no response at all. They're completely tolerized to a response to a pro-inflammatory mediator. So the immune mechanisms in these fetuses are very subtly and profoundly modulated by inflammatory exposures. And we think that has implications. So intraamniotic in inflammation induces choriamnionitis, lung and systemic inflammation, and a bunch of other things that I've talked about. It turns out that the exposure to intraamniotic endotoxin and urea plasma, although that, those data aren't here, also causes inflammation and acceleration, accelerated cornification of the skin. And we've always worried about uh, endotoxin causing sepsis, pneumonia, and maybe affecting the gut. But here's a demonstration that actually the biggest surface area of the fetus, the skin, is actually responding as well. And I think that's something we haven't thought about very much. And these are data for the gut, just looking at MPO expression in, in the fetal gut. And this is CD3 lymphocyte uh, marker expression. And the exposure to LPS causes changes in the gut as well. So we suspect that some of these diseases we don't understand, such as late onset sepsis, necrotizing enterocolitis, and some of the lung immune diseases in later childhood are actually mediated by immune uh, modulation that's occurring before delivery. And our tiny little babies have a really different immune system, probably, than uh, the fetus that would normally be in utero at 24 weeks gestation because of antenatal infection, because of beta-methasone exposure, and then because of everything that happens to them as secondary exposures after preterm labor and delivery. So now let's go to the uh, organ of all organs, the brain, and, and think about what happens in these babies in terms of their brain and brain development, because I think this is ultimately uh, where the rubber hits the road for, and uh, Donna Ferraro is just arriving, so she can now critique uh, the last 10 slides of my talk, um, about what happens to the fetal brain in these very, very preterm infants. Because again, I think that's very important, obviously, in terms of our outcomes and, and our goals. So I would argue that the preterm brain is just like the kidney, is just like the immune system, and is just like the lung, that it must adapt rapidly to preterm birth. And there's, a, there's just a sort of a thought exercise, which I'll go through with you for IVH on that. And this preterm ba baby ha uh, has to adapt in terms of what's happening with IVH, which happens with new neurosensory stimuli. There's clearly stimuli in utero, but they're different and more stimuli post-delivery. And also to acute changes in the endocrine environment, because the agents that cause maturation in multiple developmental systems, such as T4 and cortisol, have to go up in these babies after delivery for the baby to survive. And so they're bathed in a high cortisol environment, a high T3 environment, uh, a high vasopressin environment, all that sort of stuff, where they would normally wouldn't be from 24 weeks to term. And that must impact how organs develop. And they also have to, besides adapting with all that, they have to grow. So let's look at the brain. And it's interesting to me, um, we know 
still very little about what truly causes intraventricular hemorrhage. There's lots of hypotheses about pressure and flow, and we know which part of the brain the bleeding occurs in. But, and, and for the good news is that over the last 20 years, the incidence of IVH has dramatically decreased in clinical populations, although we really don't know why that's happened in our clinical care, but we are doing better. But I would just have you think about this. Let's say a preterm baby is born and there's no change in the vasculature or pressure flow relationships or whatever's going on in, that, in those zones of bleeding. At 24 weeks, the risk of a severe IVH is at least 25% in our populations. At 25 weeks, if the baby were born at 25 weeks, it would be about 20%. At 26 weeks, it would be about 15%. 27 weeks, it would be about 10%, and so on and so forth. So if the baby's propensity to bleed did not change acutely after the first couple days of life, the risk of IVH would be 75%, because we just sum that up. This is a very simplistic way to think about this. But the fact of life is the risk is 25%. It's the risk at the gestation the baby's born at. And within the first two or three days of life, the risk of that severe IVH disappears. So clearly that brain changes. We don't know how it changes. It'd be really interesting to know, but we don't know how it changes. And while it's changing, going from 24 weeks to 40 weeks, it's got to do a fair bit of growing. So just in terms of mass, it goes from 100 grams to 350 grams. But more uh, 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 importantly, and Donna showed you a similar slide before, it has to change in its complexity. And these are just pictures of a 26-week uh, gestation brain, a 29-week gestation brain, and a 36-week gestation brain in terms of the complexity of the surface of that brain as it has to grow. Now, um, the folks at Hammersmith uh, are, uh, were the first folks to ever have an MR unit in their NICU where they've done sequential MR studies on these babies. And this is a measure of cortex uh, convolutions. So it's the complexity of the surface of the brain is what this is. And this is gestational age. And these are preterm infants. So clearly their brain is growing in size, their head's growing. And the complexity of the surface of the brain is growing. But at term, their brain is less complex than term babies. So this is, again, the same measurement of term babies versus preterm babies. So their brains are growing, but this sort of gross structural thing isn't really as complex in these babies that were preterm at term than if you were born at term. So I want to build on that a little bit. These are data from uh, Terry Ender looking at deep nuclear gray matter volumes. And this is done by MR. Uh, uh, trying to measure volumes in the brain. This is the term range, and these are the volumes at term of babies that were born at 22 weeks, 24, this is 23 actually, 24, 25, and so on. And so there's this regression curve that these babies that were born very, very preterm have less deep nuclear gray matter at term than term babies. So again, another indication that there's so, something different about the brain of these babies. So let's look at some other data. These are data from, um, from Yale a number of years ago. So they're quite old data, but I like them because of the way they present the data, which I think actually a neonatologist can understand rather than some of this uh, more elaborate imaging stuff. Uh, these are uh, children who are born preterm at uh, 29 weeks gestation. So that's not very preterm. 900 grams, and they were selected because they didn't have bad bleeds or PVL. Uh, and they had an IQ, which wasn't actually so bad, but their term comparison group had a much higher IQ, but these studies were done at Yale, so these are all smart kids, and these are probably normal kids um, at eight years of age. So we're, look, we're used to looking at uh, color maps uh, but this is a color map of a statistical significance, not of blood flow or something else. So anything uh, that's, that's light blue or shading towards red is a difference in the volume of the area of the brain that's mapped out in a preterm versus a term. And the color is a level of significance. And what you can see by the color of the brains, this is the surface, this is the internal surface, and these are ventricular systems is that the brain volumes are different in these preterms who are now 
uh, eight years of age rather than uh, 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 terms that are eight years of age. So there's residual effects on lung volumes, and they're different. Some of them are larger and some of them are smaller, but the end result is, is that, that the brain structure at a very gross level is different. So this is an experiment I really liked, and uh, when I put this talk together, uh, I just, I'd read a new review by um, the folks from Yale, and this paper wasn't mentioned in the review. And so I called up uh, Laura Mint and I said, or I emailed her, and I said, what's the story? Don't you believe these data anymore? And she said, oh, yeah, that was a really good experiment. We just didn't include it in the review. So I, they, still re they still believe these data, which I think are just fascinating in terms of thinking about preterms versus terms. So the experiment is to take, to look at languaging pro language processing in preterms and terms who are now eight years of age and doing a functional MRI study to look at where there's activation in the brain in terms of how they're thinking. And what they did is they took these 26 preterms and uh, they were 29 weeks gestation and they compared them to terms. And again, they're the same population here. And they gave them a stimulus in the MR unit. They read the ugly duckling, the fairy tale, the ugly duckling, to these kids and looked at language processing. And so you can do that two ways. You can look at how they sense the, the sound, and then you can ha how they process the sound. So those are really two distinct functions. And then they map the brain regions that were uh, activated or suppressed. And these are just pictures from the paper of terms versus preterms, and they look a little bit be uh, different, but you can look at different parts of the brain. And what you see is the curves are going in different directions in a term or a preterm in terms of how they're processing sound and language. And to interpret that into English for you, preterm infants process meaningful speech in the same way, in the same brain region, that term infants process meaningless sound. So they have it backwards in terms of the area of the brain they're using for the processing. And a lower verbal IQ correlated with uh, more disturbed neural processing. So they understand the fairy tale. They have normal IQs. They just use a different part of their brain for the processing function. And I think that is really, really spooky in terms of thinking about how the brain works and how we may be modifying development in these uh, kids. So as I come to a close here, it seems to me neurodevelopment is ultimately our goal, getting optimal neurodevelopment. And there's two basic mechanisms that can alter neurodevelopment that we have to deal with in neonatology. One is this induced maturation phenomena that may interfere with normal developmental timing and progression. And there's lots of experiments in developmental biology. If you force an, a system to miss a step, it can't come back and pick it up again. So if we force the kidney to develop in such a way that it's missed the opportunity to form all its glomeruli, you're never going to have those glomeruli. So that's the kind of concept that's a developmental biology concept in terms of inducing, forcing maturation in these babies. If we don't have the maturation, we won't have survival, but we may pay a price for that. And the other is injury, and we clearly know that IVH and PVL and injury kinds of things to kidneys or lungs or brains are going to have a bad outcome and either may prevent normal organ development and alter function um, of uh, a maturing organ. These are data from Neil Marlowe, and I like them because of the way they presented the data. Uh, these are uh, data from the Epicure study on cognitive scores at six years of age of surviving infants, and this is a, a, a population-based study of the UK uh, babies less than 26 weeks gestation. So these are the little guys, and this was uh, now 15 years ago. But basically, the way I look at this, these are boys and these are girls, and this is by gestational age, 23 weeks or less, 24, 25, and a comparison group of term kids who are a little bit better than normal. I'm not sure that's true of the whole UK population. But, um, but what I would suggest to you, if when you look at this, is this doesn't look so much like injury, because I think if you were thinking about injury, what you'd have is a normal distribution, and then maybe something down here is a second hump. If you were really, the, if your only damage mechanism was to injure, 
you'd separate a normal population from an injured population. But what you actually have is a shift in the population down about 20 points in these earliest gestational ages and not so much in these later. The boys are a little worse than the girls. But you have a downshift in the population distribution which looks very much similar. And so to me, that suggests to me that a lot of this isn't injury, but in fact, it's it's, we're altering developmental program, which may be a real problem because that's a lot harder to fix than injury. So my sort of final take on this in terms of a concern is the more physiologically healthy the very preterm pre infant is, the more fetal adaptions that that kid has had to make and the more postnatal adaptions that kid has had to make uh, uh, to, that will facilitate that for uh, survival. So what ends up happening, saying that a different way, the more normal the very low birth weight infant is, the more abnormal the development is. Because we've actually forced the development to go early rather than to be uh, normal. And these quite miraculous developmental adaptations certainly can have long-term uh, uh, implications in terms of health. So I like this saying because it's true. Life is a universally fatal sexually transmitted disease. So there's certain things we can't avoid. Uh, thanks very much. OK. These are rather different talks, so we probably ought to just do questions now. Yeah. That must have provoked some thoughts from somebody. Because I think what you have to think about when you go home and take care of these little babies is first why they survive, and then what are those adaptations to survival, and what are the implications to making those adaptations? And that's what we don't understand very well. I just want you to comment on nutrition, because these, Absolutely. these children are eight years old, and at least in our department, the nutrition we give today, we believe, are much more uh, much better than we did uh, eight years ago. And there are studies showing that IQs and everything is related to, uh, to how you give the brain building blocks in form of nutrition, so. Absolutely, and, and, and one could make another uh, argument. You could pick almost any organ and make these sorts of arguments in terms of a developmental system. And nutrition is probably a really important overriding driving factor. But I guess what, I, what I'm trying to come to grips with is if we accept, and I don't know if it's true today, but if we accept that there's a 15-point IQ deficit in babies that are 24 to 25 weeks gestation for population studies, you know, uh, cross populations, then how can we fix that? Well, each of us have our own particular biases and preferences. One might be that we could fix it with nutrition. Um, Lucas would suggest that if we gave these babies all breast milk that they'd be, have 10, 10 uh, point better IQ. Breast milk isn't going to work just in, uh, for these babies because they need a lot of supplements. So if we could get the breast milk right and the supplements right, you know, then maybe we could increase their IQ by 10 points. But then there's the folks who really believe, and there may be some validity to that, that if we do perfect developmental care, that will also improve their IQ by 10 points. And there's other folks that feel, that feel that if we did something endocrinologically, we might improve their IQ by 10 points. And you start adding up the 10 points, and they should all be geniuses, right? So the, the issue is, is I think it's really complex, and things are overlaying here. And what is the biggest predictor of good neurodevelopmental outcome? Maternal socioeconomic status. And that probably has a genetic component and a social component and a financial component and an educational component, and all those things are part of that. But it's clear that with these tiny babies, if they're put in the right environment, that they have a lot of plasticity and that that brain will actually probably work better in that environment than if it's in a, in a deprived environment. And so that if we deprive a preterm baby of the appropriate stimuli, that's probably a bigger hit than doing that to a term kid. Because 
they probably they have plasticity, and they and as as Donna Ferrara showed you the other day, I mean you can have a baby who has a big old hit uh, anatomically uh, in the brain in a motor in a motor uh, in motor cortex and have very minimal paralysis. They can figure out how to get around that. So it's ma they have massive ability in terms of plasticity, but they probably have less plasticity than a term baby does. And so we have to optimize that plasticity to get optimum outcomes. And the best way to have that is rich mothers in a good environment. But unfortunately, those aren't the people that have preterm babies. Um, but, but I think these are the kinds of things we have to think about uh, in terms of what's going on. And I absolutely agree. Nutrition is really important. It would be just really good if we knew what we should give them and how we should best do it. But <laughs> and, and that gets you into another sort of dilemma. I have another little thought thing that I think is really interesting to think about. Let's say it's an ethical dilemma. Let's say you have a population of babies less than 1,000 grams, and you want to optimize neurodevelopmental outcome. And you believe, which is not an unreasonable belief, that if you do aggressive nutrition by pushing calories, oral calories, that what you'll do is improve the IQ by 10 points. Okay, That's a reasonable hypothesis. But the problem is that you're going to take your neck rate from 5% to 10% and your mortality rate from 3% to 6%. So what you're going to do is improve the IQ of the survivors and have more babies that die. So what are you going to do? And I think that may be some of the dilemma we may get into with some of this, that if we really want to optimize nutrition, we're going to take some risks to get the nutrition. I mean, they're very old data to say if you don't feed babies, they don't get neck. Uh, that's pretty straightforward. So you can prevent neck by not feeding babies, but that's not such a good trade-off in terms of neurodevelopment. And I think some of these are the issues we have to think about as we move forward. Dr. Morley. <laughs> We've had discussions like this for 40 years, so. I can't be surprised by what he's going to ask. <laughs> the one thing we never discuss is the endocrine environment of these babies. So if this little preemie baby, let's say he's born at 26 weeks and stayed in utero, so you'll be absolutely soaked in maternal hormones, placental Estrogen, hormones, progesterone. Estrogen, progesterone. Right. And as we know, because I'm surrounded by them, having estrogen is pretty good for your brain development and all this. If you're a thing. girl. If you're a girl. That's why we struggle to keep up with them. So, um, and, and yet we never discuss the fact that yeah. suddenly these babies have a major endocrine crisis. It's all gone. They, they're not expecting to be born, and they're losing all this stuff, which is probably very important for their development. So why aren't we replacing the hormones that they would be getting in utero in order to uh, uh, have that effect on their well, development? Well, there, there are folks in Ulm, is it Ulm, that um, have done experiments in animals and a few experiments in babies of giving babies progesterone and estrogen, boys and girls, uh, to replace their, uh, their hormone status. And there's data, data in baboons. Or, Baboons? Yeah, it's baboon data. It's Shaw's data that, that, that show that this, this, this is actually good for lung maturation and lung development. So um, there are data to say that our preemies might be better all being treated as girls rather than boys after their preterm birth. And of course, the girls have their cortisol and um, uh, progesterone fall as well. But of course, so some hormones are falling. Others, like cortisol, are going up. T3 is going up. Um, so that the whole endocrine milieu is completely changing after preterm birth. And it would be a real challenge to figure out how to reproduce the fetal endocrine state after preterm birth. Because if you don't have cortisol, you won't maintain your blood pressure. And if you don't have T3, that's going to generate some other problems, probably in terms of brain development. So these babies are adapting to these hormones, which we know drive development in animal models. What happens if you have a tadpole and you pour T3 in the, in the, in the, in the water? They differentiate to a frog. Uh, so you know these things uh, are, are really potent 
um, maturational signals, and they're completely different after preterm birth in our babies. So it seems to me that the miracle of these babies is that they actually develop as normally as they do under the circumstances. And, and, and if we could start to understand that, we might understand why some of them have deficits and what those deficits are. But it's probably very complicated. And I think preventing injury is good. We should always prevent injury. But we have more problems here in terms of developmental pathways and sequencing probably than just injury. That's my take on it anyway. Dr. Ferraro, I'm going to make you say something. What, what do you think about these preterms and their brain development? <laughs> she just probably had a very long, long lunch and two glasses of wine. <laughs> I had one apple um, and a cappuccino, but a little before lunchtime, so I'm not a bad dad having cappuccino for lunch. Um, I think it's not so critically dependent on gestational age. I think at least um, when Sono Bonifacio looked at RMR data and tried to correlate it with birth weight and age, we did not see a good correlation between microstructural development and age. So I think that there are many more postnatal factors, and I truly believe what you just said about uh, these modifiable factors like nutrition enriched environment um, and specifically and you didn't I don't know if you talked about it and I'm sorry we got here late because we thought you were starting later <laughs> uh, infection yeah. and many of these babies have even mild systemic inflammation and infection and I think Steve Miller's work shows clearly that these modifiable factors impact brain development so I think those are much more important than just saying, oh, the baby's 23 weeks, forget about it. So.